Hello everyone, it's me, Dr. Michelle Mazur, and I am so excited for the Positioning Power webinar. And I know we still have a few people coming in to the room, but first, could you type in the chat box that, yes, whoop, whoop, we can hear you, Michelle, loud and clear, because it's always great for me to know that you indeed can hear me. Secondly, a little Google Hangout issue is that there is a 45 second delay between when I speak and when you actually get to hear me. So whenever I ask you a question to like type into the chat box, it will take a few seconds for it to actually show up that you can hear me or whatever I'm asking you. So the reason I'm so excited today is that I have spent several months just noodling. Oh, and Scott says we can hear you. Awesome, yay, thank you, Scott. So I've spent the past several months trying to answer this question of what makes some speakers stand out and break through while others just struggle to get speaking gigs and to get their name out there and to get any traction with their message. And what it took me a while, but what I've come up with is this idea of positioning power. And today's webinar is all content. There's like no stupid webinar formula internet thingy that I'm going to be doing, but really all content. And I know some of you are new to me and some of you are old, I guess very familiar with me, but just let me give you an example. A uh, quick introduction to who I am. I'm Michelle Mazur. I'm the CEO of Communication Rebel, and I deliver audacious breakthroughs to speakers who want to not only be the best in class in their field, but also want to position themselves as a category of one. I have a PhD in communication with a specialty in persuasion, so I know how to how message processing works and how audiences receive messages. And my newest thing is that I just became a Fascinate certified advisor with Sally Hogshead. And that's one of the things I'm gonna be talking about today as well. So you all can hear me. I hope you are all ready to start thinking about your positioning power. So what I'm gonna do is switch over to the screen to my slides or the screen share. And just give me one second. All right. And hopefully now you can see my screen. If you can see the screen, type in, yes, I can see your screen, Michelle. And while we're waiting on the delay, if you do have any technical problems, like you can't hear me all of a sudden or your video drops out, the best thing to do is to refresh your screen. Typically, Webinar Jam works best with either Chrome or Firefox for some reason. So just realize that if you're having some problems, just refresh the browser and see if that works for you. And Rosanna says, yes, we can see my screen. Carrie says, yes. Leslie, yes. Awesome. I'm so excited. All right. So we're going to dive into this idea of positioning power and what I think are the three major components of it. Oh, it's so exciting. <laughs> and this is one of my favorite quotes from Sally Hogshead. She says, you're either creating value or taking up space. And Sally and I are very aligned in our beliefs that speakers should always be creating value. And not only that, to position yourself well, the value that you create must be unique. Otherwise, your message is just taking up space. It is just noise. And it is going to get lost in the sea of competition that is the crowded speaker marketplace. And it's going to sound like everything else that's out there. And that's, I don't want that for you. I don't want that for any of the speakers that I work with.
And when I was in Orlando in January working with Sally, Sally commands $35,000 for her keynote speeches. And I was in her hot seat and she asked me, you know, she told me that she was making $35,000 for her keynotes before she had a New York Times bestselling book. And 35 grand is like that standard, like if you have if you're on the New York Times, that's how much you charge. And so she asked me, you know, do you want to know how I get that amount of money when I didn't have a best-selling book? And I'm like, yes, yes, I want to know. And simply, she said, I deliver something no one else can deliver. She is creating value in a way way that no one else can create. She has really positioned herself as a category of one. And when you do that, you can charge more. She, on days that she has speaking uh, engagements, she actually has up to four alternatives in case the first one falls through. And that's pretty amazing to me that you know she is so in demand that conference planners will change dates just to accommodate her schedule so keep this in mind you're either creating value or taking up space you're blending into the noise and this really takes me back to my days in market research i worked in marketing and market research for about five years and for Three or four of those I was in consumer product goods and did a lot of work in the dairy category. And here's the problem with dairy, milk, right? Milk is milk. There's skim milk, there's 1% milk, there's whole milk, but other than that, it doesn't matter if you buy the generic store brand milk or you buy the premium dairy gold milk. It's still milk. There's nothing special about it. And back in November, I did a consult with a speaker and he asked me, he was, he was really struggling with how to get traction because he felt like he was a great speaker, his content was really amazing, but he just wasn't booking any speaking gigs. And what he didn't know is before the call, I had watched his speaking clips, and what I saw was milk. It was the same stories that other leadership speakers are talking about, the same st statistics and studies that other speakers cite in their speeches, and the same conclusions. He was pretty much milk. And when you're milk, you're interchangeable. And when someone is looking for a speaker and you're drawing the same conclusions, giving the same content as other speakers in your field, as a new speaker, you won't get hired. The meeting planners will go with the people they already have a relationship with, the people they know, the people they like, the people they trust. So as a speaker, you cannot be milk because commodities compete on price. If you want to command a premium for what you do, if you want those high prestige speaking gigs, let's say you want to speak at TEDx or you want to be speaking at World Domination Summit or Social Media Expo or one of those conferences, you cannot be a commodity because you're always going to compete on price and they're always going to go with the, with the speaker they know versus the speaker they don't know. And when you posi and all of that can start changing for you when you start positioning, positioning yourself as a category of one, much like Sally Hogshead does. There, another speaker, his name is Eric Wall, who I love, he's phenomenal, and he brings in graffiti art into his speeches, and they're very dynamic, and their experiences, and no one can do what he does. And I know right now, when you start thinking about this, you're like, oh, how am I 
ever, ever going to position myself as a category of just one person. That sounds almost impossible and like a lot of work. And I'm here to tell you it's not impossible, but yes, there's going to be some work involved and a lot of thinking about who you want to be and how you want to show up in the speaking world. And this is, and this is how I'm looking at it, called positioning power. And basically, it is where your ideas, your advantage, and your audience collide to really hone in on what you do well, how you deliver it differently, and the change that you only can deliver to that audience. And in the next 40 minutes-ish or so, we're gonna be diving into these three areas, ideas, your advantage, and your audience. And one of the things I have as a surprise for you all is at the end of this webinar, you will get a workbook that details all of this for your positioning power. So don't feel like you have to like hurry up and write everything down as I go through it. But at the end, you'll be able to download, you'll get the replay and be able to download. And I'm going to keep this replay up forever because this is something that you're not going to be able to complete overnight and that you'll want to revisit again and again and go through that workbook and really hone in on how you should be positioning yourself so you can get those speaking gigs. And then the other surprise I have for you is at the end, there's going to be a giveaway. I'm super excited about this. I'll tell you more about it like halfway through the, through the, the presentation because it's going to be a lot of fun and I think I'll give you some insights if you win. And there's not just one prize, there's actually three and I'll tell you about that later. So let's get into your positioning power. And the first, part of this and as some of my clients in oh rosanna says yay a workbook <laughs> oh and i love it jackhead it's like new goal i don't want to be chocolate milk amen jackhead you are way better than that <laughs> and i will be looking at this chat box as we go through and seeing if there are any comments or questions and there'll be some time for questions at the end as well all right your big idea equals presentation success. And if you've worked with me before, you know that I, this is one of my strong viewpoints, is that you need a big idea behind your presentation. It's what you want your audience to remember after you speak, and it's also how you get your audience to spread your message for you. And I always think about the big idea this way, is that that if you are walking down a hallway and you see a person and they say, oh man, I missed Jackett's speech. What was it about? That person should answer with your big idea statement. It is the message that you want to spread. But to take this a step further, that big idea statement is something that needs to be unique and it needs to position you well within your industry. And the first step, and probably the most intensive step, is you have to understand the conversation that you participate in. Understand the conversation that you participate in. There are so many speakers out there. Let's say I'll just pick the topic of leadership because that seems to be a very broad category. And they go out and they create these speeches about leadership, but they don't understand the conversation that they're participating in. And what I mean by that is you have to do your research on the competitive landscape of who else is talking about leadership or your topic, how are they talking about it, what is their unique viewpoint about this topic of leadership. 
And when you start doing that and you start identifying like some of the top speakers of your field, some of the mid-level, I don't want you to do this from a point of comparison of thinking, oh my gosh, this person's on fire. They get, you know, $50,000 per speaking gig. I can never be like that. I want you to listen to their ideas and understand the conversation that they're participating in because your goal, once you understand that conversation, is that you either want to challenge the conversation or add to the conversation. And what you decide to do, whether you're a challenger type or you want to add something new to the conversation, really relies on your advantage, which we'll talk about next. But your first major task to position yourself is understanding that conversation and what other people are saying. And then, and some of you might be lucky enough to already know that conversation, what other people are saying. Like if you're in leadership and you've been following Dan Pink, you've read his book, that's awesome. Like how can you add on to what Dan Pink is saying? How can you challenge what he is saying? And then once you understand the conversation that you're participating in as a speaker, you can start answering these three questions. And when I start working with speakers, if they really don't know what they want to say about their topic, like they have a topic, it's really big in their head, they have a lot of ideas, I will ask them these three questions. So question number one is, what makes you go on a rant? What just gets under your skin that if somebody asks you a question about it, you will just talk their ear off in a very passionate and powerful way because it just annoys you so much. And we all have these hot button topics that when we hear it, we just roll our eyes and think, oh, really? A great example from my own experience is when I started out as a blogger, I really struggled finding my voice as a blogger because I came from an academic background and academics write in a very, very technical kind of way. And my breakthrough came when I saw a speaker who, oh boy, <laughs> just ticked me off in a way that I had never experienced. And just to give you a quick taste of this, we walked in the room, the audience, we all sat down, there were order forms on our seats. And the speaker walks to the front of the room and she says, now everybody stand up. So being the good audience, we all stand up. Now clap. So we start clapping for her. And she says, you've given me a standing ovation and now I need to earn it. And I had never felt so manipulated in my life by a speaker. The woman next to me took her order form that was on her seat and started ripping it up very slowly and loudly into a million tiny pieces. And that inspired a blog post that actually got me my first client because he liked my perspective. So think about what makes you go on a rant? And if you want to, if, you, if it's top of mind for you, you can put it in the chat box right now. I'll look at it in a few minutes. But for some people, this is a great way to find a unique viewpoint. The second question is, what do you geek out on? What do you geek out? out on. And when I say geek out, I'm really talking about this idea of getting into a sense of flow when you do your work. Like you feel like you are operating at your absolute best, that the time stands still, you've lost all track of it, and you're really doing your best work. 
I like to also think about this as um, your zone of genius from Gail Hendricks' book. Um, now I forgot the name of her book, but it's about upper limit problems. But when you get into that sense of flow, that is what you geek out on. And a quick example of this is one of my clients, Mindy. She is half financial planner, half money coach. And what she is brilliant at is looking at all of your financials, all of that data, and figuring out how you should expect more from your money. That is what she does. Whatever your dream, whatever your goal is, she is looking for a way to make your money work from you and how to expect more from your money. And that is her genius. So some people, I just want to go back to the rants thing very quickly. So Michael says he's never thought about looking at his rants before. Leslie, deception by the food industry with regards to our children. Ugh, coming from the food industry, Leslie, yes, that's a very important rant. And Becky says one of her rants is dismissing small towns as dying or disappearing or needing to be saved. So those types of ideas can help you position. And then think about, okay, what makes me amazing as a speaker? What ideas, what do I do that I am so good at that I can spend the rest of my life doing that I don't even think I should get paid for? Although you should get paid. The third and final question I want you to think about is what are you afraid to admit about your industry? This question should scare you a little bit. And in your head, think about the Frankenstein movie. And, you know, when the villagers get very angry and they come after Frankenstein with torches and pitchforks and battering rams, that's what I want you to think about something that scares you, that if you came out and said it about your industry, that you feel like you would be taking a risk, that you would be challenging the status quo, and that it would be something that's different than what's already being said, or what the you know gurus say. So for me, one of my big admissions that I've come out with this year is I believe selling from the stage is ruining presentations. I mean, if you go to enough networking events or other types of events and you've seen someone pitch from the stage and you've seen a lot of pitching from the stage, it's because there's a formula out there about like speak to sell, six figure speaking. That's all about how to get the people in the audience to pay you money. And while that is nice, it is not the purpose of public speaking. The purpose of speaking is to grow relationships with the audience and to create value for them. And the speak and speakers shouldn't be viewing their audience as bags of money sitting in uncomfortable chairs. And this opinion is very contrary to what, uh, what, what's out there in the world of public speaking. But I believe there's a way that you can promote your business and sell what you do in a way that is not a formula that's high pressure. Stampede to the back of the room and sign up now because there's only 10 spots. So what are you afraid to admit about your industry? And I'm not going to ask you to share this, but, you know, keep it to yourself and eventually you'll feel like, okay, I want to talk about this. So Michael just comment, oh, wow, I just said to someone, why is an event just an opportunity to sell something else? Shouldn't you sell the event and make it worth paying for? Yes, Michael, yes, that is my whole entire point. So it's been great because people have resonated with it because I'm not the only one who's sick of it. Yay. <laughs> so moving on from this, so these are the three ideas or three questions you want to be thinking about to mine your ideas for your positioning. 
The second part of my positioning pillars or the second pillar is how do you fascinate? And as I mentioned earlier, I've been doing some work with Sally Hogshead around fascination advantage and I'm one of her certified fascinate advisors. But what I would love right now is if you've taken the fascination assessment and know your archetype to type it into the chat box. I just kind of want to see who's with us. And if you've never heard of Sally Hogshead or have no idea what this fascination advantage is, I'm going to talk a little bit about that right now. And I love this because I think this is such a unique perspective. So Sally says that different is better and that there are so many personality tests out there on the market that tell you how you see the world. So Myers-Briggs, Strength Finder, DISC, all of that is how, the, how you see the world. What Sally Hogshead has done with her fascination advantage system is she took all of her knowledge of marketing and branding and came up with an assessment of how the world sees you at your best. So how the world sees you. And that is how you create value. So Michaela said she's never heard about it. Um, we have a couple of connoisseurs, a catalyst. Ooh, Bita, I'm sorry if I say your name wrong. You're an artisan. My fiance is an artisan. We have a connoisseur. Yay. And, oh, power and innovation, which I think is a change agent. So we have a very wide range. And I'm going to put up a pop-in right now that if you're interested in hearing about or taking the exam, if you follow this Get Started link, you will actually end up going and taking the exam there. It's like a $37 cost, but the wait till you hear the information that you get. So we have a wide variety of people. Ooh, the Veiled Strength. That's pretty awesome. I've never, I've never run into the Veiled Strength yet. Andrea. Oh, Andrea. Oh, I know you. <laughs> All right. So different is better. So Sally's background is marketing and branding. She launched the Mini Cooper in the United States. She's an award-winning copywriter. And what she discovered is she took what she learned from branding and marketing and distilled it into these seven languages of fascination. And everyone on this webinar has all seven of these fascination advantages. We have two, which are our primary and our secondary advantage that form an archetype, which I'll talk about in a minute. And our primary and our secondary advantage is getting back to almost that state of flow. When we are communicating with, their, with those advantages, we are at our absolute best. So for instance, my primary advantage is innovation. So I'm all about ideas. And when I'm able to work with a client and help them create their ideas or create something new from the ideas they already have, I am working at my best. Other people might have mystique as their language, their primary language. And that's the language of listening. And when you're a mystique personality, you love collecting all the information that other people are saying and then carefully considering that and formulating your own opinion. So we have our primary advantage and our secondary, and those are our wellspring where we feel really great. And then the, we also have a dormant advantage. Now a dormant advantage is feels like we're drowning when we have to operate in that. It is our quick sand. And for example, my quick sand is mystique. You will always know exactly how I feel. Always. You can read it on my face. If I have to try to be political or backhanded or back channels, I'm awful at that stuff. Even when I'm writing and I think, oh, well, I should be mysterious about what I'm, you know, like 
what this blog post is about. It's, oh, it's so bad for me. I just don't operate well there. It drains me and I just can't do it. So that's why corporate life was not so good for Michelle because <laughs> she is not political. So if you take the assessment, you'll know your top two advantages and your dormant advantage. And combined, your top two com advantages combined together formulate your archetype. And so that's what you were seeing with some of the people on this call is like there's the maestro, there's the catalyst, there's the veiled strength. So there's 49 different archetypes, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about how uh, some of these archetypes can be used in speaking. So the first one is my archetype. I am a maverick leader, and that means I my primary is language is innovation, and my secondary is power. And when I first discovered I was a maverick leader, I thought it was BS, quite frankly, because I didn't see myself as a maverick leader. I saw myself as a, a passion person, actually, who speaks like the language of relationships. At that time, my business was named Relationally Speaking. And what happened was I started asking my fiance and my friends about my archetype and reading them the description. And all of them were like, oh, yeah, that's so you. And that inspired me to change the name of my company to Communication Rebel because that is me. And when I look back, I now see how I am a maverick leader. But when you first get your results, you might be like, oh, I think I'm something else, or I think I'm this, because you like the name better, you like the adjectives better, or it's your twin, which we'll talk about in a second. And really, it's, once again, how the world sees you, not how you see the world. So if you feel like your archetype doesn't fit you, then ask other people around you. One of my friends and clients said, well, I'm a connoisseur, but I think I'm, I'm actually a talent. And so I read through both of those descriptions and I totally saw her as a connoisseur. Like she like has a light in her eye when she presents, she's super well connected, but she doesn't see herself that way. So we always have a blind spot. So think about it. If your archetype doesn't match up, be like, oh. But how I use Maverick Leader in my speaking is I should never show up as like a normal speaker. So th even from my dress, like I don't go to speaking events wearing a pencil skirt and a suit coat. I'm not comfortable, it is not me. I'll rock some Betty Page or a retro dress, but I will never show up to a speaking gig. And my job, I feel like as a speaker, is to push boundaries, the innovation. And then on the stage, I'm always drawing from my power and especially when I give the last line, I always write that from my ad power advantage because I want you to remember that and I want you to feel challenged by it. So that's the maverick leader. Another example is the maestro. I know we have a few of those on the phone. I have another client who is a maestro and maestros speak the language of authority and prestige. And prestige means that you are constantly raising the bar. You have really high standards, super high standards. And I love the picture of the orchestra because the conductor is called the maestro. He has attention to the details and understands that, oh, the clarinets are a little bit flat right now and the percussion is playing a little too fast. How do I fix that? How do I make it better for them? And for speakers, if you're a maestro, you command that stage with your authority and with your power. And if you're trying to give a presentation from like with that has a lot of statistics and details, that's probably not your highest value and your use. And you're going to challenge your audience to raise the bar for themselves. So you have this authority, you're going to have strong command of the stage, and then you're also wanting the audience to raise the bar of themselves. And also, speaking from 
creating your presentation, you really go for perfection. You spend a lot of time thinking about what words are the right words, what stories are the right stories. So that's the maestro. The last one I'll talk about is the provocateur. I just love this picture of the legs. I think it's hysterical. <laughs> the provocateur is primary innovation, secondary mystique. I have a friend who actually is a leadership speaker and he has lots of big ideas, but he didn't see how his mystique showed up for him. And I saw him speak recently and what was super interesting is he presented these big juicy ideas that really like stuck with the audience but it wasn't anything the audience could really answer in the moment. And he was provoking you to think in a different way, to come up with different ideas, and left you with something that you were like, oh man, I really wanna talk with him more because I feel like there's more there. And that's what a provocateur can do on stage. They can leave you with their ideas that make you feel like, oh, there's so much more where that comes from and I really wanna go and pick this guy's brain because there's more there. So that is the provocateur. And at the end of this call, I am going to give away three 30-minute sessions for people for, to hop on the phone with me. And we're going to go through your fascination assessment together and talk about how you can use this as a speaker. So that's the giveaway at the end. So we'll talk about your archetype and your advantages and your dormant. But I just have to say that this is so incredible and has changed so much for me. And the last little part of this I want to give to you is something that we can't really go into today, but Sally talks a lot about this, and it's your anthem, which is your tagline for your personality, which honestly is key. It is so very key to positioning yourself as a speaker. And when I first heard this, I was like, ah, a tagline? Oh, that's such crap. I hate taglines. Like, I don't even have a tagline for your for my business like why do i need a tagline for my personality and the anthem allows you to front load your value and it's just two words it's an adjective and it's a noun and it's based off of your assessment because in your assessment you'll get adjectives that describe your archetype and the noun is based off of the results you deliver best so a couple of examples. My anthem is Audacious Breakthrough, which I, like, when I discovered this, it was, I felt so expansive. I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, that's, that's what I do. And if you notice at the beginning of the webinar, when I introduced myself, I said, I deliver audacious breakthroughs to speakers. And this is really what makes me unique. And it's just not about my business or about giving audacious breakthroughs to my audience. I realize that as a friend, um, I do this for my friends. They're struggling with something and I help them break through it so they see it in a different way. I challenge them, I'm bold. And it's just like this wonderful way to think about myself and how I relate and how I can lead with my best value. So another example is Sally's is fascinating communication. Probably not surprising since that's her whole shtick, but she wants everything that she does to be fascinating. And in order for her to do that as a speaker, she has a whole routine lined up so she can deliver this in her keynotes. Heck, her business cards are even fascinating right like her business cards are two dollars each and they're like pull tabs and you can pull your two innovation or your two advantages and she gives them to you and says oh i see you as innovation and power and and gives you her business card it's amazing like business cards that are fascinating but you can see the power of this and if you're interested in this she does offer a class in how to develop your anthem, which is completely invaluable and how I came up with Audacious Breakthrough. So that will be in the resource section of the email that I'm gonna send out later. So your anthem, your advantage, so important to trying to find what you uniquely bring because your 
archetype really positions you well to deliver what no one else can deliver along with your ideas. Whew, that was meaty. All right, I, I'll probably do another whole webinar on just fascination. Oh, and some people are sharing their anthems. Oh, Rosanna's is approachable caretaking. Oh, I like that. That's very nice. Oh, and the other thing, and she says at the present, the other thing about your anthem is it's written on a piece of paper, not on a tombstone. So think about it that way. You can always go back if your anthem doesn't feel quite right. You can always go back and change it. It's much like a tagline for your business, but, but for you. All right. The last component of this positioning power is the audience. And they are the most important people in the room. Now, if you're in my speaking collective, you, which is my small group mastermind public speaking coaching program, this is going to look very familiar to you because this is part of their challenge for this month is getting into their audience's head. But it's also about how you're going to position yourself because the audience is everything to a speaker. And our job is to create the best experience for them possible. Oh, I love the audience. And you should too. And the question that I want you to be able to answer as, as a result of hearing me speak, how will my audience change? As a result of hearing me speak, how will my audience change? because you need to deliver a result to that audience. I have to say the days of motivational speaking of live your best life, create your own destiny, it's dying. No one wants to hear that. Like we know that, like how can we make that happen? What action can we take to create it? So such a crucial question. A difficult question to answer, but I'm going to give you some three other questions to think about that will help you answer this question very quickly. The first question is, who are these people? Now, if you have a speaking gig that you have booked and is coming up, please do your research on who is showing up their demographics, their psychographics. Like think about, you know, are they millennials or are they boomers? Because that affects the stories you're going to tell and the points you're going to make. Are they married with children? Are they mostly single? Are they more affluent? All of, what kind of job do they have? All of this helps you really figure out who these people are that are showing up. And then getting into their psychographics a little bit. You know, where are they hanging out online? What types of magazines do they read? Or, you know, like uh, for me, I know like my ideal people love to read Fast Company, for instance. But developing almost like a demographic and psychographic profile of who the people are and doing your research if you've booked a gig or if you're just getting into speaking and you have a business and your audience is the same as your ideal client, repurpose the ideal client work you've done. There's no reason to recreate the wheel here. The second question is probably my favorite. What do they believe about your message? And I want you to think about what they agree with you on already, like you know that some parts of your message, oh my gosh, that's going to be very easy for them to accept. I'm gonna get 100% of the heads nodding with me. But also think about what parts of the message are they going to resist? Where they're thinking, oh gosh, I don't know about that. Uh, that sounds like a lot of work. I just don't wanna do that. Because there is magic that happens in resistance and value that is created for the audience in that resistance. So if you think back to the beginning of the webinar and I talked about understanding the conversation and doing the research, 
I know that sounds like a lot of work and that comparison is going to come up for you. So I just talked about those things because when I talk about your resistance, you think, oh, she actually gets it. Like she knows what she's telling us is, is going to be some work for us or it's gonna like drum up that voice in your head that says, I'm not good enough. So that is a pivotal question. What do they believe about your message? And then the money question, as I like to call it, is what are their challenges? You know, this is the typical what's keeping them up at night, what pain do they currently have, what confusion are they suffering from, but not just thinking about that confusion, taking it a step or multiple steps deeper. So if you are doing talks on interviewing, or actually, hmm, switch the example. Let's say you're giving a talk on how to write better emails. Well, you know, writing is challenging for a lot of people. And one of the first things they might be thinking is like, yeah, it takes me a really long time to write an email. And uh, especially when it's a difficult one where I have to communicate some bad news, that's really hard. And that, but going deeper, like if they know that they can't write well, they're going to waste a lot of time on that email. If it doesn't come off well, they are ruining their reputation in their organization. It's going to show that they can't communicate. It's going to show that they can't get promoted because they're not a leader because they don't communicate in the written form well. And then it's going to limit like how much money they can make and whether they can take that vacation they want to take. So you can always go deep with their challenges. But at the but what you need to deliver is a solution to that because that's what people are going to pay you for and it can't be the same you know if I'm giving a writing workshop I don't want to be talking about grammar like that's not something I'm going to be talking about I would present it in a very different way give them a very different solution and when you have this profile of who are these people what do they believe about your message and what are their challenges it becomes far easier to answer this question. As a result of hearing me speak, how will my audience change? And when you know that, and when you know how you are adding, adding to the conversation or challenging the conversation, and what makes you unique and what fascinates other people about you, it's so much easier to find your positioning power. So whew, that was a lot of information. I'm, do you have any questions or what questions do you have for me? And I'm going to look through some of the Uh, I'm just looking through chat and having a sip of water. Oh, you guys have some really great rants and viewpoints. That's making me happy. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And then it, we'll do questions for about 10 minutes-ish. And then I'm going to tell you how you can take advantage of the free 30-minute session or the giveaway for three free 30-minute sessions to go through your fascination assessment. And if you don't have an assessment, you'll need to take one. So I'm excited about that. Okay, Sonia has a great question. How do you find the psychographics of your audience? And I'm taking a sip of water because I'm really thirsty. So that's an awesome question. And the psychographics, one, I mean, there's a lot of different ways. It's a lot, it's research first off. And finding out, you know, like if you know that, let's say your ideal audience is moms between the ages of 34 through 55, first off, you probably know some people. 
ask them where are they hanging out online what are they you know what what are their concerns what are their issues what are their attitudes what's troubling them the most and using your own network to actually find out some of the attitudes because like people hang out with like people so tap into your network or even if you're at a networking event say I really want to talk to this type of person and then have those people find them for you and then do research online go to forums where you think that target market is go hanging out go to the LinkedIn groups because they're out there and they're gathered together and you can really dive in and find some of those psychographics by just doing a little additional research and polling the people you know in your network Eme just asked how do I get a hold of the assessment there will be a link well, there should be a little pop-in, but I know some people don't see it. It says, find out your personality's number one advantage, get started. That will take you there. Also, about an hour after the end of the webinar, there's going to be a um, an email that goes out with the workbook, but also a link to the assessment and to the Anthem Builder if you're interested. Let's see, who else has questions? Paula has asked me, what has been the speech you have given that you felt most happy with? Oh, that's a good question. I have worked recently on the speech about the big idea, and I'm really loving that. And it's still in development. I'm still playing with it. I've given it several times. But you, you saw part of it in this presentation, but I love talking about ideas and I am really at my best when I can help you find your ideas. Dawn, what's the best way to find your positioning power? How do you make yourself unique? Great question. In the workbook at the very end, and I forgot to mention this, is the final step is after you go through this these three parts is that you have to review and come up with like a positioning statement for yourself and this is going to be an iterative process so you'll come back to it many times it's also a process you want feedback on so Don is a member of the speaking collective it would be something that you would want to put in the speaking collective or if you have other speaker friends run it by them your clients that you love run it by them probably not your fiance or husband or wife because uh, sometimes they're not the best to ask these things for okay Amy Lang said define that would you unless you already did I don't know what that means Rebecca says I write and speak about how to move through transitions with intention my questions my question is who am I in conversation with and who is my competition okay so I don't know the answer to that question because that is definitely not my speaking space. So I would say, who talked, okay, in one of my calls that I had yesterday with the Speaking Collective, there is a book on transitions. If you email me, which I'll give my email in a, in a minute, I can hook you up with that book, but it is about transitions and intentions, and it's ooh, a book that's been out for quite some time, and that might be a good place to start. Also, Amazon, looking at Amazon, and seeing what books are in your topic and category, and those people are probably speaking, because people who have books tend to speak. Elizabeth, can you give an example of the difference between the message about living your best life and actions towards living your best life? You said this is part of our discussion. As a result of hearing me speak, how will my audience change? Yeah, well, so what I find about the traditional ways of motivational speaking, they get up on stage and they're there to inspire you to do this like live your best life, make the changes you want to make. And there's really no how to that. It's just this dose of inspiration and you feel great for a couple of hours and then you think, oh my gosh, now what? So if you want to help people make a change, and this goes for any of my friends who are in business as life coaches or any anyone in that area, you have to come up with your own 
process or way of doing that so that you can give that to people so that there is something they can do immediately after you finish speaking that can help them have a better life because I mean ultimately that is a goal you want to like make somebody's life a little bit easier because of your message so what is the next logical step they can take after hearing you speak All right. Another question. Do you recommend blogging about your speaking ideas and topics in advance to trying to land the speaking engagement, or is it better for the message to be fresh? Oh, no, no, no. Please blog. Blog about your speaking topics. And one of the things I want to say about this is you should be experimenting with your content and seeing what people resonate with. So blogging is a great way to do that. Tweeting is an excellent way to do that. I think about my client and friend, Tara Gentile. She's also my business mentor. She started like formulating her book on Facebook, like putting out these quotes she was thinking about for quiet power strategy and seeing how people responded. So yes, put your stuff out there, experiment with it, see what resonates with people. <laughs> um, Vita asks, how do you recognize the advantages of others? Do you have hints? And I would say, first, you have to like really bone up on Sally's work, like read her book, how, how the world sees you. And then you start seeing patterns, like just subtle things. And I have to say, I'm better at recognizing some advantages better than others. Like, and honestly, I, I don't have a whole lot of like alert people in my life, for instance. <laughs> so I don't really reckon, well, I do recognize that advantage a little bit more easily when I see it because it's so different from the other people I have in my life. But once you really understand like the work that Sally's done in each of uh, each, the seven different languages she talks about, if you start seeing patterns in people and then you go, oh, I wonder if they're a passion person, or I wonder if their archetype is the connoisseur, so. Okay. Do you have any tips for finding speaking gigs? And this will be my, yeah, this will be the last question I can take. My tips for finding speaking gigs, and the way that I know to do this best, it's honestly all about your network. Like, you need to be out there networking, find, building relationships. If there's an organization you really want to speak to, start stalking them on Twitter or Facebook or, where, or LinkedIn or wherever they're hanging out on social media. Start developing relationships with them. That's not about like, hey, give me a speaking gig. And also, look at your network. Is there someone in your network that could help you get an introduction to somebody who does plan meetings or a conference? Really, it is leveraging your network. I mean, I've most of the speakers that I've worked with, they get their speaking gigs because of their network. All right, whew, those were really great questions. So what I'm going to do next is tell you about our giveaway, and I'm typing just right now. So what I'm going to do is in one is that. I'm losing my thoughts. <laughs> okay. So the giveaway, I'm giving three fascination assessments for speakers. You have to provide the assessment, and then I'm going to walk through with you and see how you can leverage that better with your speaking. So we'll hop on a call for 30 minutes. You'll send me your archetype and report for beforehand, and I can get ready and prep. So in order to take advantage of that, what you will need to do is be one of the first three people, I feel like a radio host, who emails me at Michelle at Dr. Michelle Mazur and puts fascinate in the subject line. So that's, once again, as you are scrambling off, three archetype 
breakthrough sessions or whatever I want to call them, where we'll go through your assessment. If you are one of the first three emailers at Michelle at drmichellemazur.com, I will be announcing the winners later today when you get the recording. I'm very excited to try this out. And Honestly, my hope is for all of you who are still on the call and not to have just like, woo, I'm emailing Michelle right now, is that you re-watch this, you go through the workbook, you start thinking deeply about how you position yourself. Positioning doesn't happen easily for even like the big brands that are out there, like Nike and Google and Apple. They had to come up with their positioning. And as speakers, you have to come up with your positioning as well. So thank you so much for joining me live today. This has been awesome. And I can't wait to do something similar in the future because I'm sure I'm going to be talking about fascination more. And I'm definitely going to revisit this topic as well. And I hope you will enjoy me. Have a wonderful rest of your day.